Yeah. And uh, Lord, help us to hear your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in line with that song that they just sang, we're going to talk about one of the most popular topics everybody wants to talk about, and that's death. I, I, there are probably not very many topics that you want to avoid, but if you bring up the topic of death, most people would rather sidestep it. In fact, in our society, we have, uh, have sidestepped it in so many ways. We have uh, lots of euphemisms to avoid using the word death. Uh, we might say they passed, passed on, or passed away. They're resting in peace, eternal rest, asleep, demise, deceased, departed, gone, lost, slipped away, lost her battle, lost her life, succumbed, gave up the ghost, kicked the bucket, didn't make it, breathed her last, want to be with the Lord, went to heaven, met his maker, we call, was called home, is in a better place. All those things are ways we describe someone who, who dies uh, because we, we try to soften the, the idea of the idea of death. But uh, let me just share a few thoughts I found this week about uh, people who said something about death. Woody Allen, uh, most of my unfavorite character, but he said, I don't mind dying, I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> and these are some children. Jim said, when you die, they bury you in the ground and your soul goes to heaven, but your body can't go to heaven because it's too crowded up there already. Judy says, only good people go to heaven. The other people go to where it's hot all the time, like Florida. <laughs> and John says, maybe I'll die someday, but I hope I don't die on my birthday, because it's no fun to celebrate your birthday if you're dead. <laughs> and Marcia, Sarah, Sarah will enjoy this one. When you die, you don't have to do homework in heaven, unless your teacher's there, too. <laughs> We talk about death, and, and probably if we think about it, most of us have some thought in our mind about the way we don't want to die. Uh, you know, most of us would say, I hope I die in my sleep and just peacefully. So I want to put your mind at rest. I want to share nine ways that you are least likely to die in this. <laughs> the least likely way to die is a shark attack. One in 300 million are your odds of that happening. Best way is to stay out of the ocean altogether. That's, in a fairground accident, one in 300 million. So all those of you who are paranoid about riding on rides, you can ride them and, and maybe never have to worry about it. That's not going to get me on those rides, by the way. Falling coconut, one in 250 million chance. Just don't go to Hawaii. In a plane crash, your odds are one in 11 million. Struck by lightning, one in 10 million. Snake bite, one in three and a half million. Here's one, falling out of bed. You have a one in two million chance of dying by falling out of bed. And the one you really need to worry about, drowning in a bathtub, one in 685,000. So take that and, and deal with it. But those are least likely ways to die. So. So maybe put, some of you put your mind to rest, and next time you get on an airplane, you'll feel a little more comfortable or going on a ride. But the fact is, we all die. Statistics tell us one out of one people die. Uh, that's, that's just simply the, the truth. And, and the fact is, we need to understand some things about death. Number one, we need to understand that death was never intended for us. I don't know if you realize that, or not, but we were never intended to experience that thing called death. It, if you go back to the garden, you'll see Adam and Eve were created. They walked in close fellowship with God, and God said, you can eat of any tree except that one. On the day you eat of that tree, you will surely die. And sure enough, being obedient children that they were, they went and ate of that tree, and they suffered consequences. Number one, they were separated from God. They no longer had close fellowship with Him. We call that spiritual death. And they also were kicked out of the garden and cut off from the tree of life, and death became the ultimate outcome. The Bible tells us in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. So the thing we're talking about today is a consequence of, of our own actions. And the Bible tells us all have sinned. It's not just because Adam and Eve sinned, but all of us have made that choice to disobey God in our lives. 
And the penalty of that is death. Physical death has come to Adam down through the generations. And so we deal with that today, the reality of death. But I think the big question for us to wrestle with is not, will I die? That, that, there's no question about that. The big question I want you to, to wrap in your head and maybe think about is what will happen after I die? What happens when I experience death? And I want us to look at Luke 16, 19 through 31 today because it, the Bible gives us a few hints throughout, but this one kind of gives us a, a, a brief or a condensed glance of what may we may expect or should expect when death comes. Let's just pick up verse 19. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. This guy had everything. He, for us, he would be a guy who dressed in Armani and Gucci. He drove the best cars. He went to the best. He had everything life could ever, you could ever want in life. See, this is a guy. And then he says, in contrast, at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. If you look at that story... Uh, and then we're going to, verse 22, the time came when the beggar died and the rich man also died. What I take from that, and it's not on your outline, but I, the one thing I thought of is that death is universal. It doesn't matter who you are in life. It doesn't matter what you have. It doesn't matter where you are. Every one of us is going to face that experience in life unless Jesus comes first. So what happens? After we die. Let's pick up that story and finish it out. And then we'll go back and make a few observations. The time came when the beggar died. And the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In, it says hell, but should be Hades. Where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house. For I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. I think there's four things in there that, that I think we need to, we can state confidently about what happens after we die. Oops. Number one, our body dies. The physical body dies. That, that, that's the, the reality of it all. A beggar died and the rich man died. Now, there's a couple things in there significant we're we'll going to look at a little bit more. But that's the fact, is that when we die, our body dies. Now, go to 2 Corinthians with the first chapter 5. I don't think I have it up here. Oh, yep, I do. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And Paul writes about it like this. Now we know that if the earthly tent, that's, that's how he describes the body, our earth, the earthly tent. Now, who can tell me something about what a tent's for? Temporary shelter. Temporary, we go camping, we set up, when we go camping, we set up a tent, and we live in that tent for a week. So Paul is talking about our physical body as a temporary shelter, a temporary housing for our spirit. He says, if we, now we know if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, Longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Anybody here ever groan in life? Uh, maybe we whine. We don't groan. Uh, meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. 
For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who made us for this very purpose and has given us has given us the spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. And I love this. Therefore we are, listen to me, he's talking about that. Therefore, facing that reality, we are always confident. Not fearful, not, not dreading it. We are confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please Him. And here's the whole purpose. Notice what Paul says. While I'm in this body or when I die, my whole purpose is to do what? Please Him. To please Him. Whether we are at home in the body or away from it, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So really, we need to understand, this body that we live in is a temporary shelter. What, this body that you see standing up here today, I want you to know, is not Don Shelton. This body is just a temporary manifestation that you know is Don Shelton. Now, I'm getting really ethereal, aren't I? Getting really out there. The real Don Shelton lives inside this body. Let me put it practical. Let me put it. Today, you leave church, drive up to the corner at the stop sign, you look to the right, and you're going to see a house. And you're going to look at that house and say, those of you who know, that's where the Sheltons live. That's our house. It, it, but if something happens to that house, if it's suddenly destroyed today, that house is taken away, Dolores and I will still be alive. When our body dies, that's all that dies. Our spirit will continue on. I know, it's kind of deep and kind of, kind of thought-provoking, isn't it? But Paul says, first note, it's the body that dies. Genesis 3.19, God says, By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since it, from, from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. That's a description of death. This body's going to die, it's going to be buried away, and it's going to, uh, to return to the elements it was made out of. So as people gather for your service on, on that day when, when they come to celebrate you and tell you how people how, what a great person you are, they are saying goodbye to a body. They are not saying goodbye to you. I, I remember a story a reading you know, Tom Sawyer. If anybody read Tom Sawyer, remember, remember the point in time when uh, everybody thought Tom and Huck had died in the river? And... Uh, and they, uh, they managed to get back in town just in time for the funeral. And they surreptitiously came into the back and they were wondering who died. And then all of a sudden they sat there and they listened to people tell people about how great these young men were. I mean, they lied through their teeth about these young boys. <laughs> and they, they were able to see everything and hear everything people thought of them. Now take that with you and the next time you go to a funeral... Perhaps, and we're going to talk a little bit more deeply in a moment, think about the fact when everybody comes to say goodbye to your body, perhaps you are going to be there surreptitiously hearing everything they say about you. So when you come to my funeral, I want you to know I'm going to be listening. <laughs> it's just the body that dies. That body will be done away with. And, and that leads us to the second thing. Our body dies, the beggar died, the rich man died. Differing experiences. If you look at it, it says the beggar died and what happened? You got your Bibles there. He died and what happened? The angels carried him away. Notice what happened to the rich man. The rich man died and was buried. 
I, I want us to get a handle on the contrast between the experience of death for those who believe and those who don't. Those who believe God does not leave alone in that experience. He sends, I believe he sends his angels, he sends uh, comfort to you and helps you through that time so it's not that desperate, agonizing time. You know, we did George uh, Lee's service a couple weeks ago, and, and the weeks ahead, he talked, before he died, he talked about seeing Della in his house. And I thought, maybe God is, in his mercy, sent Della back to remind him that it's where he's looking forward to and what's going to happen. God did not leave him alone. The non-believer, on the other hand, died and was buried. I can tell you from both experiences, having been present when a believer dies and when a non-believer dies, it is a completely different experience. And I believe it's because God takes care of us and comforts us and guides us through that experience of life. So our body dies. Number two, our spirit lives on. Our spirit lives on. I, I want to share a little poem with you I found. It says, this one, a headstone in London reads like this. Beneath these clods and beneath these trees lies the body of Solomon Pease. This is not Pease, it's only his pod. P Pease has shelled out and gone home to God. <laughs> that, I mean, you've got to appreciate his humor. You've got to appreciate the reality that he knew his body was going to die, but he was going to live on. And our spirit lives on. The story of Jesus describes these individuals. Look at them. After they die, they're still possessing their personal identity. They're still possessing their intellect. They're still possessing the ability to communicate. And that even indicates that they have an ability to see between the different realms. So they are living. They are individuals. They are personality. And... You can all count it a blessing that when I die, my personality is going to live on. Those of you who know me will appreciate that. I will still be the same person that you hear and experience today. I know you want a special section of heaven for, for me, right? But my, I will live on. One guy has said you will never be more alive than on the day you die. While everybody else is at, at Aunt Alma's eating the potluck and celebrating, you are going to be experiencing life in one way or another. Your spirit lives on. And I, wanna, I think that causes us to understand the fact that physical death is the result of our spirit leaving our body. Uh, if you look at the crucifixion, you go to John 19, verse 30, and Jesus is on the cross. He's been through the afternoon, and he's come to the end. Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head, and what? Gave up his spirit. His spirit departed from the physical body and continued to live on. There's another story in Luke, the eighth chapter, that, that is uh, equally good, because it says he went to heal a girl who died while he was on, her, on his way, he comes into the room and said, the girl's still asleep, and people laugh at him and mock him, but Luke 18, 8, 54 and 55 says, but he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up, and what's it say? Her spirit returned. Now, I don't know about all these near-death experiences people have. You hear stories about people being able to look down in the surgical room and seeing the doctors and identifying who's there and seeing things going on around them. I don't know... I'm not validating one way or the other, but is it possible that in that setting, the spirit has withdrawn from the body and God says it's not time yet and sends that spirit back into that person? Our spirit dies. As long as my spirit remains in me, I live. The minute my spirit departs, this body dies. But I live on. I continue to live. After death, we will maintain our identity. I believe we're going to know one another. Uh, we'll maintain our personality. We're going to be just as grumpy or happy or complain. I don't know what we're going to be like, but we're going to be that person we are here. We're going to have intellectual awareness. It's going to be even greater. We will know more now. We, we, all the things you forget now, you'll remember. 
you'll, you'll not have that short-term memory loss as you get older. We'll have ability to communicate. And we'll be able to see into other realms. It, it, look at Luke 16, 23 through 24 um, with me for just a moment. Because we see that in verse 16, or verse 23 and 24, if I can get there. It says, the time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in hell, or Hades, where he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away. He's, he's separate from that, but he's looking, and he can see what's going on. And he pleads with Abraham to, to send Lazarus to relieve him of the torment. So there's that ability to see. Will we be able to see what's going on in, on earth? Will we be able to see what's going on in, in the place of eternal punishment? Will, it seems to indicate that. But we'll maintain our personality. We'll maintain who we are. Hebrews 12, 1 is another verse that talks about it. It says, because you are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Uh, Hebrews 11 talks about all those heroes of faith. But I have a hunch, and I, I just wonder, if when we depart this life, if we're not going to be able to sit in glory and sit down and watch our loved ones walk and run their journey of faith. Are we going to be able to see them and we can applaud and we can cheer and we can celebrate their victories? And, and somehow or other, even if it's a disappointment, God's going to moderate that. It's not going to be painful, but we'll be able to see our loved ones as they continue through this life. It's an interesting concept. I am not making any guarantees about this, but this is just the way I look at Scripture and what this story tells us. After you die, you will be more alive than you've ever been. You're going to experience life, you're going to experience reality in a way you've never experienced it before. But truth number three, let's see, the earthly is left behind. All, everything here is left behind. There was a man who was dying, and he called his wife in and says, I want to make known my last request. He said, my last request is this, that you go to the bank and you take out every dollar that we have in the bank and you put it in the coffin with me because I want to take it with me. Well, the day of the funeral came and, and somebody knowing his request went to his wife and said, well, did you do what he said? She says, yeah, I did, except there wasn't room in the casket for all that cash, so I just wrote him a check. <laughs> when we leave this life, everything we have is left behind. Ecclesiastes put it like that. Naked a man comes from his mother's womb, and as he comes, so he departs. He takes nothing from his labor that he can carry in his hand. When we die, everything we've clamored for, everything we've worked for, everything we've tried to get for ourselves, our position, our power, our, our prominence, it's going to be departed. We're going to be left behind with that. Paul put it like this, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. Everything we've worked so hard to gain in this life will be left for others to use. It'll be given to others, and we have no control over it once we die. Because of that, Jesus said, store up treasures for, your, for yourselves, treasures in heaven, where moth and rust don't destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there you will be also. There your heart, excuse me, there your heart will be also. And Paul expanded on that. He said, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of life that is truly life. We spend so much time thinking about this life. We spend so much time trying to, to build a legacy, trying to have the nicest things, drive the nicest cars, wear the nicest clothes, in reality, we're thinking about it all wrong, that there's coming a life that all that's going to be left behind. And so what are we doing to prepare for that life that's to come? The earthly is left behind. And number four, 
our eternal destiny is determined. I got another headstone I want to share with you. This one's in Indiana. It says, pause, stranger, when you pass by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. So prepare for death and follow me. And underneath that, someone had taken something and scratched into the headstone and said, to follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> Hebrews 9.27 is a passage that weighs in heavy here because it says, just as man is destined to die once and after that face the judgment. Once we die, we have set our eternal destiny forever. We are, we are going to be where we are, who we are, and we will face the judgment. And in judgment, there are two thrones identified. It's interesting. Revelation 20, verse 11, identifies the great white throne. And there, if you read the text, it shows all the dead will appear before that great white throne. And it's like a courtroom. You go there, and you're the defendant. And there you will hear the judgment against you. You will hear the evidence and a verdict will be rendered. And those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life will be sent to eternal torment. And those who are will be saved. It's a, it's a legal setting. It's, a, it's an idea of, of determining our, our sentence or our, our future. But also in 2 Corinthians 5.10, which we already read, said we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Different word. The judgment here is the word bemas, B-E-M-A-S, and it is the judgment seat of an athletic event. You watch the Olympics. You know, you watch the figure skaters and the gymnasts, and, and uh, the judges are sitting there, and they'll hold up your piece of paper with a score on it, right? And whoever gets the highest score gets first prize, gets the gold medal, and, and they're handed out that way. That's the image here. And I believe it relates to us as believers that we come before the judgment seat of Christ and our works are going to be reviewed, are going to be revealed, and we're going to be receiving rewards from Jesus based on the life we lived here. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15 talks about our works being tested by fire. And if they survive, it says if you've worked with hay and stubble and, and done worthless things, they'll be consumed, but you will be saved. But if you've built with gold and silver, they will endure and reward will be given. So there's two judgment seats. And wherever we are when we die is where we will remain. If you look, if you look down at Luke 16 for me, Abraham responds to the rich man's request. He said, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. Once you die, your eternal future is fixed. There's no going back and forth. There's no going to the place of torment and saying, boy, I didn't realize it was going to be this bad, and I went out of here. It's fixed. And the Bible calls those two futures heaven and hell. And we, when we die, when we take our last breath, that's set for us. It's this life in which we make the choice. It's this life that we have to determine what's going to happen after we die. And that's the big question. I, I want all of us to, to answer it. And the, question, the most important question you're going to ever answer in your life is what's going to happen after I die? Am I going to go and be with Jesus and live in a place of comfort and ease and, and joy and happiness? Or am I going to experience torment, sadness, and pain for eternity? There's no bigger question you're going to ever answer in your life than that. But the good news is today we come and celebrate the resurrection and because of the resurrection, Jesus changed the face of death. Jesus changed it forever. If you go back to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. It 
the writer of Hebrews says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil. And look at verse 15, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. What did Jesus' resurrection do for us? Took away the fear of death. It changed death from an enemy to a friend. You know, read Paul's writings, and he said, I don't know which to choose. I don't know whether I want to stay here and work with you and, and be used by God, or whether I want to go home to be with, leave this body and be with Jesus. He says, you know, I would prefer to be there. But it is, I think, it's still time for me to stay here. He wanted to be, death didn't hold fear for him. And it shouldn't hold fear for anyone who believes in Jesus because it, it is the access to our eternal relationship with Jesus. Go to John chapter 11, 25 and 26. Jesus has come to uh, Martha and Mary at the time of Lazarus' death. And Jesus gives these words to Martha. 25 and 26, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And then 1 Corinthians 15, 54 through 57, Paul concludes with these words. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So I just put it to you. As you leave here today, what will happen after you die? And what you believe about that will always determine the way you live today. What will happen? Will you go on living in joy and comfort? And the reality is Jesus is the key to that question. It all depends on what you do with Jesus. The one who died on a cross for you, the one who was buried, the one who rose to give you life eternal. Well, you might ask, how do I do that? What, what does that involve? And it, Number one, it, it involves believing in Jesus, that, that Jesus is the only one who is capable of saving me, that his death on the cross was for me it, to cure a sin problem that I had that I didn't even know I had. Sin has has killed me and Jesus died on the cross to forgive me and cleanse me of that sin. He's the only one that can do it. We have absolute belief, dependence, and trust in that. Second of all, there has to be a desire to change my life. I need to be understanding that I have lived my own life, my own way, and that's taken me the wrong direction and I need to make a determination now. I want to live for Jesus. I want to live God's way. And then scripture tells us we will confess with our lips that Jesus is Lord. We'll confess with our lips our absolute dependence on him and, and a commitment that I'm going to live with him as ruler of my life. And then the next thing it says is to be baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of sin, to walk in newness of life, and then to live a life of obedience to him. That's what it is. And that action will change everything about what happens after you die. But the whole question is, what are you going to do with Jesus? What will you do with him today? Where do you want to spend your eternity after this body dies? Resurrection is the answer of hope beyond this life. That's what we celebrate today. 
we come and celebrate the resurrection. We celebrate it every Sunday as we come together as believers because every Sunday we're reminded that Jesus is the one who's given us life. Do you know the answer to what's going to happen to you after you die? I want to tell you, today you can know. And today you can take action to have that answer sealed by placing your trust in Jesus. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for Jesus. Father, thank you for the hope we have. Father, that reminds us this body is nothing more than uh, just a vessel. But Father, the real us uh, living in our spirit and that we will have a life following this one. The destination and the quality of that life is depend, dependent upon our decisions today. Lord, help us to choose life. Help us to choose comfort and joy and peace. Father, speak to us now as we sing this song together. Would you move us and draw us to your side? We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. In